Welcome back to Physics 141. We're moving into the section now where we're going to develop ideas about potential energy and then we'll be able to use that to write down the law of conservation of energy and that will be a very important problem-solving tool for problems in this section of the course. Uh, the law of conservation of energy is one of the three great conservation laws of classical physics. We'll be studying all of these this semester and this is the first one. And as our starting point, we realize that some of the forces that do work on objects have a special property. And the property is that the work that they do when an object moves from point one to point two does not depend on the path that it travels. In other words, if this force is acting on the object and it travels along path A from one to two, or B, or C, the work that that force does is exactly the same and those forces are called conservative forces. They're special in physics because we can use them to define a potential energy function for them. And these kinds of terms, potential energy terms, allow us to write down the law of conservation of energy. So, as we move forward, we'll see that this is very important. Just uh, in sort of a schematic sense, the work this force does from one to two is equal to the work it does along path A, B, C, or any path, if it's a conservative force. So, uh, this begs the question, how do we define potential energy, and what kind of forces do we know that are conservative, that have this property? So let's first define potential energy. For a conservative force, we define a potential energy function that shows us what the change in energy is associated with the motion of an object from one position to another and it's an object that's acting upon, act, acted upon by this force. So the change in potential energy, and U is the symbol that's used for potential energy, but the change as the object moves from point one to point two is the final minus the initial potential energy. And here's the definition. This change in potential energy is defined as minus the work done by the conservative force. So remembering the definition of work, uh, the most uh, general definition involves an integral because it might have a force that's changing as the object moves from one position to another. So, so we, we might very well have to do a complicated integral for a force that's changing with position. On the other hand, if it's just a one-dimensional system where the object is moving only along the x direction, it simplifies the definition a little bit. Instead of having the dot product, we just have the component of the force along the x direction times dx integrated from position 1 to position 2. The reason for the minus sign will become clear in just a moment. So, in other words, the change in the potential energy when an object moves from an initial to a final position is the opposite of the work done by the conservative force. So, the forces that we've talked about so far, of those forces, two of them are conservative forces that we can then write down potential energy functions for, gravitational forces and spring forces. So let's consider both of those. When we have an object that's lifted from the Earth's surface up to some final height h, then we can calculate the work that the gravitational force does as the object moves. And so that allows us to get the potential energy change. So first of all, as the object, let's say you pick up a box off the floor and you raise it straight up, it undergoes a displacement, delta r, which is h, that height, times j hat, if we define the y direction to be positive upward. And while you're lifting it up, the gravitational force is still acting on it. So as the object is moving up, the gravitational force is pointing down with a value minus mg, in the j hat direction. So it's in the minus j hat direction or downward. Using the definition of potential energy, the change in potential energy is minus the work done by gravity and the minus sign is here. The work done by gravitational force, since it's a constant force near the Earth's surface, is just the dot product of the gravitational force vector and the displacement vector, fg dot delta r. And those two are both acting along the j hat direction with a minus sign of course, so we get minus, the dot product gives us minus mgh, right, minus mg times h, and the negative signs cancel out to give us mgh. And this explains why the minus sign was there in the definition for potential energy change, because as we lift an object up, it's pretty clear 
that the energy associated with its position goes up. If we release it from this height h that we've raised it to, it's going to accelerate downward and gain kinetic energy. And so this is the reason that we define something called potential energy. It's an energy of position. And the minus sign is there so that when we calculate the potential energy change, a motion upward causes the potential energy to increase. The change in u is positive, mgh. So the result of this tells us that the gravitational potential energy uh, u, well, I'll put a subscript g on it now, u minus u0 is mgh, or u is u0 plus mgh. And u0 is just the potential energy value where it started, where uh, the initial position was. Usually, uh, although we can define that to be any arbitrary constant that we, ought, we want, we usually choose it to be 0 at the initial value. So if we let u0 equal to 0 at the Earth's surface, we get the simple re result that the gravitational potential energy for an object at a height h above the Earth's surface is mgh. A lot of times I will use mgy simply because y is the position variable for position in the y direction and it makes sense uh, to write it down that way. But you'll recognize that these two equations are basically the same thing. Now what about a spring force? Let's calculate the potential energy change when a spring is stretched from the equilibrium position where it would be without being stretched to a final position x. So I don't show the hand on here that's pulling the mass, but imagine that you're pulling the mass, therefore stretching the spring by a distance x. And of course, as you do that, the spring force pulls back. It's a restoring force, so it pulls back toward equilibrium with a value negative k times x. So using, again, the definition of potential energy change, delta u is minus the work done by the spring force, and the spring force has the value f sub s, so it's minus kx in the uh, i-hat direction. So in this simple one-dimensional case, we get the minus fx dx prime. The prime is there just to indicate that the variable, the x prime, is not the same as the limit. And so once we plug in uh, negative kx for fx, the minus signs cancel out. The k is a constant that can be brought outside the integral and all that's left is this very simple integral. And you'll remember the rule when we calculate these things that if you have x to a certain power, you raise the power by 1 and divide by the power. So this is x to the first power, so it becomes x squared over 2. And that when you plug in the limits, you'll find out that the re result for the potential energy change is 1 half kx squared. And you might have seen this in a physics class before. Once again, the u0 value is the value of the potential energy at the initial position. We usually choose that to be 0 at x equals 0 because the spring there is not stretched, so there really isn't any energy stored in the spring at that point. And if we make that definition, we get that the spring potential energy is 1 half kx squared. So the result of these two calculations gives us standard equations to use for the gravitational potential energy and for the potential energy of a spring. Let's put this together. The conservation of energy principle is obtained in one very quick step from the work energy theorem. And you'll remember that the work energy theorem said that the net work done on an object was equal to its kinetic energy final minus its initial kinetic energy. So 1 half mv final squared minus 1 half mv initial squared. What we do is simply take this network and say that part of it is the work done by conservative forces, and then part of it, perhaps, is work done by non-conservative forces, forces where the work they do does depend on the path. And the most prominent one of these that we will deal with is the force of friction. So we know that we can write down the work done by conservative forces in terms of the potential energy. The work done by non-conservative forces, we will just leave in this form WNC. All right, so the work done by a conservative force is minus the change in potential energy. In other words, it's delta U is U final minus U initial, but if we put the minus sign in front of it, then it becomes U initial minus U final. And we'll plug that into the expression for WC up above. So WC is replaced by U initial minus U final plus the work done by non-conservative forces equals 
the change in the kinetic energy. And from this point here, all we have to do is add k initial to both sides and add u final to both sides, and we will get this master equation that I put in a box because it's the one that you will use over and over and over again in chapter 7 and even in some later chapters as we work with problems where the energy is conserved. What I mean when I say the energy is conserved because this is one statement of the law of conservation of energy is that there's an energy balance that all of the initial energy kinetic plus potential and then if we account for energy changes due to non-conservative forces when you add those together that has to equal the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. So this, this concept of energy being conserved means that something added up in the initial situation is equal to what we have in the final situation. All right. The uh, non-conservative force term, uh, non-conservative work term again includes the effect of forces that do work that we can't write down potential energy functions for. And I've mentioned friction already. Air resistance is a form of a frictional type of force. Another one might be the tension in a rope. If a rope is used to pull an object, uh, we can't write down a potential energy function for that force, and so we would need to calculate the work done by these forces separately and plug them into this equation. And one final statement in closing this section is that mechanical energy is a term that's often used to define the sum of the kinetic and potential energies. And so E is usually the symbol that's used for this. So if we add K plus U, we can replace that by E. And remember, it's the sum of the object's energy of motion and its energy of position, kinetic and potential energy. If we adopt this definition, then we would go back to our expression for the law of conservation of energy and say that the initial energy, kinetic plus potential, plus the work done by non-conservative forces is equal to the final total energy of kinetic plus potential. So that sometimes you'll see in textbooks. And that means that if there are no non-conservative forces, or the work that they do is equal to zero, then the object's mechanical energy is conserved. E initial then would be equal to E final. And a lot of books then will refer to the law of conservation of mechanical energy. Uh, this statement here uh, simply expresses the limiting case for our more general statement of the law of conservation of energy in the situation where there's no non-conservative work term. So uh, that gives us kind of a summary of this uh, new principle, this law of conservation of energy that we're going to use extensively. And the last thing is simply to list what are the steps in applying the law of conservation of energy to solve real problems. And these problem solving steps here really are all just different parts of the idea strategy which is in our textbook. So I, here are the steps that we're going to go through over and over and over again. Uh, one and two uh, are the, the steps that usually uh, are part of the identify uh, strategy. Do we want to look at the situation and define an initial and a final moment to compare? We want to make good sketches of both of those and carefully define what we mean by the system because when we write down the energy it's the kinetic and the potential energy of a particular system. Sometimes that's just a single object, other times it could be more than one object. And then to develop a solution we want to make a list of the given information which often comes in the form of distances or positions or speeds. We also now want to write down expressions for the initial and final, uh, the, the initial uh, kinetic and potential energy, the final kinetic and potential energy, and then we need to determine whether any non-conservative forces do work. If, if they do, we have to calculate that WNC term. So are there, there are these five different terms that go into the equation shown below. We want to calculate them all separately. Then use the energy conservation equation, plug all of these five terms into it, and then use that to solve for the desired unknowns. And this belongs to the evaluation step. Uh, finally, if there are numerical values in, uh, given, we want to plug them in along with their units in order to solve for the desired unknown. And as always, we want to assess our answer to check to see if the units are right, to check to see if the numerical value makes physical sense, and perhaps there are some limiting cases that we can examine to see if they agree with what we expect.
And so with that, I will now uh, let you take a look at an example that you can find uh, that shows how to apply these steps to a very simple problem of conservation of energy.